Africa has been a hotbed of conflict for the last century. As the colonial regimes of the old world withered, the shadow of the Cold War enveloped the continent. Vast natural resources were discovered and weapons proliferated, providing the means for idealists and renegades to take power for themselves. This is Untangling Africa, and in this episode, we take a deep dive into the turmoil of Liberia's civil war. This video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. First things first, I can personally attest to this wallet being an absolute pleasure to use, as I've been using it since they sponsored our other channel, Geetsleys, around six months ago. I absolutely love the sleek design and compact size. Don't just take it from me though. The Ridge Wallet has 40,000 five-star reviews, holds up to 12 cards, plus room for cash, and the durable wallet comes with a lifetime warranty and over 30 cards and styles to choose from, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. To secure the perfect Father's Day gift, make sure to click the link below or go to ridge.com slash the front for 15% off. To tell this tale, we've got to start at the very beginning with the United States. They got involved in the scramble for Africa just as the Europeans did. They were just late to the party. One of the last regions that hadn't yet been snapped up by the colonial powers was the Pepper Coast, now Liberia. It was here that the American Colonization Society, a strange alliance of emancipist Quakers and racist slave owners, decided to send free Americans with African heritage. The Quakers believed African Americans would have a better chance there, away from racist attitudes. The slaveholders were worried about a rebellion. Both agreed that repatriation was the best course of action, so off to the Pepper Coast went anyone with African heritage who could afford the fee. And that meant any heritage, regardless of where someone might be from. Transposing the example to Europe, Imagine a motley crew of Serbs, Swiss, and Scots being repatriated to Portugal. Worse than that, the Pepper Coast was already inhabited and the locals had nothing in common with the American newcomers. The newcomers didn't want anything to do with the locals either and married only within their community. This created an America-Liberian ethnicity culturally distinct from the region's general population. This group believed itself superior to the locals and instilled a rigid class system. Contemporaries likened Liberia's regime to South Africa's apartheid, albeit based on whether one's ancestors had come from America rather than skin color. While it wasn't always called one, Liberia was a colonial state just like the others that governed most of Africa. Liberia declared independence in 1847, and the America-Liberian minority kept tight control of the country until 1980. It was supposed to be a democracy but the party representing the America Liberians ran Liberia as a one-party state. It was not to last. Citing decades of unfair treatment, economic downturn, and widespread America Liberian corruption, Master Sergeant Samuel Doe, a Liberian native, led 17 soldiers and NCOs in a coup against the regime. They killed the president and seized power, then executed the heads of government. Doe, who promoted himself to general, was the first indigenous leader of Liberia and enjoyed widespread support. He suspended the constitution but promised a return to civilian rule by 1985. Elections were held in October of that year. Doe won, but many argued the elections were fraudulent. A month later, Thomas Kwewonkpa, a military officer of the old regime who had been forced to flee, launched a counter coup. He had the support of many Gyo and Mano people, other indigenous groups that felt sidelined by Doe's preferential treatment of his own group, the Krun. Kwiwongpa's coup was a failure, however, and he was killed, and then reportedly eaten by Doe's security forces. But Kwiwongpa wasn't the only official with a grudge. Charles Taylor had been the Director General of the General Services Agency under Doe, essentially putting him in charge of government purchasing. He was sacked, however, after embezzling $1 million in government funds and escaped to the US when his crime was discovered. But he was caught, arrested on a warrant for extradition, and detained in Plymouth County Correctional Facility, Massachusetts. While awaiting trial, Taylor escaped by sawing through his window bars and abseiling to freedom with a rope made from bedsheets, after which he went dark, resurfacing weeks later as Muhammad Gaddafi's protege. During this time, he trained in guerrilla warfare and, once he was ready, he relocated to Côte d'Ivoire. Gathering exiled and disaffected Gyo and Mano people into an army named the National Patriot Front of Liberia, or the NPFL, Charles Taylor then invaded Liberia 
kicking off Liberia's first civil war in December 1989. Doe was quick to respond, sending two battalions of regular armed forces of Liberia, AFL, troops to crush Taylor's insurgency. The soldiers, of whom many were ethnic Krans, employed scorched earth tactics to deny Taylor's insurgents resources. They did this in regions dominated by Gios and Manos, however, pushing many over to the enemy. The face of the conflict changed. No longer a political campaign, it was now an ethnic war. Thousands were massacred on both sides and rape was used as a weapon of terror. Across the country, people fled from both the rebels and the soldiers. The rebels captured the strategic town of Banga in May 1990 and two months later were fighting in the outskirts of the capital Monrovia. This was the site of the worst atrocity of the war when 30 AFL soldiers shot and hacked 600 civilians to death inside St. Peter's Lutheran Church. The only survivors were several children who hid under a mound of corpses. West Africa could not sit idly by while such atrocities were committed. In August 1990, a Nigerian-led contingent of Ecomog deployed to enforce a ceasefire, evacuate foreigners and stop the massacre. Ikamog landed on the beach Normandy style and quickly captured the port despite fierce NPFL defense. The Nigerians, regarded as tough and experienced soldiers, broke the siege on President Doe's palace and forced the rebels to regroup. The NPFL splintered into two, with Prince Johnson commanding the independent NPFL or INPFL forces. Two weeks later, they intercepted Doe while he was en route to the Ikamog base for talks. The president's torture and execution were videotaped and broadcast for all to see. The AFL broke and many of Doe's loyalists fled across the border into Guinea and Sierra Leone. While they licked their wounds, Ecomog tried for peace. Six peace conferences were held, but Taylor, the principal instigator of the violence, refused to attend until they made him president. Instead, they elected Dr. Amos Sawyer, an academic, as president. Unsurprisingly, the NPFL and INPFL refused to accept him and continued fighting. Sawyer controlled Monrovia but relied on Ecomog to hold it. Chaos ruled the rest of Liberia. While Ecomog pursued peace, a new faction appeared. The United Liberation Movement of Liberia for Democracy, or ULIMO, coalesced from remnants of the AFL and Doe's loyalists. Its members briefly fought alongside government forces in Sierra Leone, then in September 1991 attacked the NPFL, conquering swathes of territory. Ulamo divided its spoils but also divided itself in the process. It broke into two factions organized on ethnic lines. Roosevelt Johnson's Kran Ulamo J and Alaji Kroma's Mandingo Ulamo K. It was these factions that sponsored some of the most deranged and brutal warlords of the entire conflict. First among these sadistic killers was General Butt Naked. And Joshua Blahi was initiated as a Kran High Priest at the tender age of 11. By 14, he was performing black magic rituals for Doe at the presidential palace to help him win the upcoming election. At 21, Blahi was a full-blown zealot convinced an ancient spirit had called him to war. His beliefs rubbed off on those around him and Blahi soon commanded a fanatical Ulamo J force comprised mostly of child soldiers. They believed in the power of his magic and Blahi concocted rituals involving copious amounts of drugs to convince them they were bulletproof. He and his flock then tore off their clothes and charged into battle, killing everything in their path. Stories of this naked lunatic circulated wildly and he became known as General Butt Naked and his disciples, the Naked Base Commandos. Fear was their primary weapon and their depravity knew no bounds. Once the Naked Base Commandos had captured an area, General Butt Naked would take more drugs to give himself a vision. The spirit would then tell him who to sacrifice. It was usually a child. In General Butt Naked's own words, they bring to me a living child that I slaughter and take the heart out to eat. What's more shocking is he wasn't the only one doing this. Aliu Kosaya, a Ulamo warlord known as Bluff Boy, also murdered and ate people, as did Mohammed Jabateh, otherwise known as Jungle Jabba. 
Acts of cannibalism usually involved the victim's heart and were used as part of rituals to gain strength and terrify foes. At this point, the UN decided to get involved. In September 1993, they sent in 368 military observers as part of UNAMIL. These soldiers deployed alongside ECOMOG but left the West Africans to do the lion's share of fighting. The situation worsened in 1994 and some UNAMIL personnel were captured and held for ransom by the rebels. The war had also kickstarted a humanitarian crisis. 1.8 million people were displaced and in desperate need of food, shelter and above all safety. In light of the constant factional fighting and warlord rule over most of the country, the UN acknowledged it wasn't up to the task. Into the gap stepped the Ghanaian president, Jerry Rowlings. Rowlings was a regional power player and his extensive connections brought Taylor and the other warlords to the negotiating table. In August 1995, Taylor's MPFL and the Ulamo factions agreed to a ceasefire. An interim civilian government held power while the country was readied for elections, but before they took place, fighting broke out again. In April 1996, NPFL attacked Monrovia. The two ethnic wings of Ulamo fought back and both sides battled against minor warlords, gang bosses and third party factions. Ecomog marched in and the uncompromising Nigerians lived up to their take no prisoners reputation. Law and order was re-established within a month, but roughly half the city was destroyed and most of its population displaced. All foreigners were pulled out by UN security forces during the fighting. They looked after their own. With Monrovia now secured by Ecomog troops, another peace conference was held. The second Abuja conference marked the 15th and final attempt at brokering a peace deal between the factions. It included a full disarmament, demobilization and reintegration package for fighters from all sides, and gave power to another civilian transitionary government named the Ruling Council. Things were relatively calm until July 1997 when elections were held. Charles Taylor led the National Patriotic Party and ran on an intimidation platform. His cooperation was critical to maintain the fragile peace, so if he pulled out, people knew the fighting and terror would resume. His slogan was probably the most on the nose in modern political history. His supporters chanted, He killed my ma, he killed my pa, but I will vote for him. Shockingly, people did. Taylor won the election in a landslide, taking 75% of the vote. The UN managed the election and upheld its results, even though it was the last thing they wanted. With Taylor's victory, unsteady peace returned to Liberia. However, violence continued to flare up in regional areas and along Liberia's borders. Taylor's political rivals were eliminated and the state industries turned over to producing goods to exchange for weapons and drugs. Taylor funneled these to gather rebel groups in West Africa and made himself incredibly rich in the process. For Ecomog and the UN, the first Liberian civil war could not have had a worse outcome. Due to a lack of records, it's impossible to say how many were killed during the conflict in Liberia. But our best guess is that between 80,000 and 200,000 people were killed between 1989 and 1997. Nearly 2 million were displaced and virtually all of Liberia's wealth was looted and its state infrastructure destroyed. But that's not where the story ends. Large numbers of ex ulamo fighters had fled over the border into Guinea and they were preparing for round two.